Okay, so this is the title that was chosen for me uh, by Leon, which is fine. I don't have any problem with the title, but I just want to let you know that even though I'm going to tell you a lot more about more, if you walk out of here certain about less, I will have done my job. And um, one of my clients is Sesame Street, so I'd just like to point out that this presentation is made possible by the letter P. <laughs> and I will be talking about all the things on this slide, but primarily the ones in the middle there, the past, perception, physics, physiology, processing, psychology, and psychophysics. And speaking of the past, I would personally be delighted if every production that I did had live organ accompaniment by Rob Richards. Okay, here are the mores that I'm going to talk about, and the ones in yellow or gold at the top are the ones that I'll devote more time to, uh, more spatial resolution or finer detail, more temporal resolution or higher frame rate, more visual dynamic range or contrast ratio, but I'll also talk about more colors, more divisions to the grayscale, more immersive sound, and more sound quality. So let's take a look at the past. Um, this is the Paris World's Fair of 1900, and at the upper left, we can see that the Lumieres were already experimenting with 60 millimeter wide frames. So they were going for more resolution. They were going for giant screens. This screen is puny compared to what they were showing at the World's Fair in 1900. See those two little dots at the bottom of the screen? Those are two people standing in front of it. Uh, Sync Sound, the Phono Cinema Teatro that I'm showing a poster of at the right, was just one of three theaters at the Paris World's Fair of 1900 that was showing Sync Sound movies. Uh, and that's 27 years before the jazz singer. Infinite aspect ratio, the cineorama was intended to show people circular movies. Uh, it worked fine, but the Paris Fire Department shut it down because they were concerned about a fire hazard. Motion platform stuff, you can see the cover of Scientific American there with the Mario-rama on it. And there was a 3D Trans-Siberian Express train ride. And TV2 uh, had a lot of stuff in the um, Moore department in the old days. This was at the 1928 Consumer Electronics Show in Germany, the Internationale Funkausstellung, and um, they were showing that we absolutely have to increase from 30 line resolution to 96 line resolution because 30 lines is clearly not adequate. And so those were the pictures that they were showing in 1928. But this is an off-screen photo in 1928 of a 30-line picture. And it looks a lot better than the 30-line pictures that the manufacturers were showing to explain why they had to go to ultra-high definition in 1928. <laughs> and you can say, oh, well, you know, that's a smaller picture, so here I'm making smaller versions, turning them sideways. There's just no question that the reality was better than what the side-by-side -side demos were showing. Now, there are some presentation problems with what I can do for you today. I cannot properly show you here either resolution, frame rate, dynamics, or color. Uh, the source material matters critically. You can put stuff up that's going to show wonderful things for color, or wonderful things for frame rate, or wonderful things for dynamics. Uh, the viewing conditions matter. Clearly, none of you are looking at a television screen right now except me. Uh, and I'm looking at it not from the nominal viewing distance of 2.7 meters or 9 feet. Um, so the screen size, the distance, the display, and the environment matter a lot. And then another thing that matters a lot is that it's still 2014. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, perception is learned. We are not born with perception. We are born with the capability of gaining perception, um, but it's a learned Factor. So they've done experiments with kittens where they've deprived them of the ability to see any horizontal lines, putting them, say, in an all-white environment where there's only vertical lines. And then they'll put a piece of glass over a gap that has horizontal lines on it, and the kitten will not step onto the glass because it's concerned that it's going to fall down because it can't see the horizontal lines. Uh, then they 
give it the horizontal lines later and it sees them. And it's not just kittens that this affects. So this was the first paying movie audience in uh, 1895 at the Lumiere Cinematograph. And uh, one of the movies that they showed was called The Arrival of the Train at the Station of La Ciotat. And here's a report from the time by Henri de Pargu. And he says, uh, one of my neighbors was so much captivated that she sprang to her feet and waited until the car disappeared before she sat down again. That's sometimes interpreted as meaning she was very scared. Well, maybe she was or maybe she was thrilled. It's hard to say. But let me show you exactly what she was looking at. That's it. It was silent. The track was not running towards the screen. It was black and white. That's what she saw. And yet she was unbelievably thrilled because people hadn't seen motion pictures before. Now, it wasn't just pictures. Here's sounds. Um, Thomas Edison came out with the phonograph, which was cylinder-based, and Emil Berliner came out with the gramophone, which was disc-based. And the gramophone eventually overtook the cylinder phonograph. So Edison finally decided he's going to have to go to discs, and he wants to get the business back, so he wants to say his discs are better than anyone else's discs. So he comes out with these things called tone tests. And in private, they would blindfold people, as you see in the middle there, or they would have things in big halls, and they would have opera singers singing, and then people would take off the blindfolds, or they'd turn the light on in the hall, and suddenly people would discover the opera singer had disappeared, and it was just the phonograph. So here's an account from one of these in Pittsburgh uh, at the big symphony hall there. The writer says, did not seem difficult to determine in the dark when the singer sang and when she did not. The writer himself was pretty sure about it until the lights were turned on and it was discovered that the singer was not on stage at all and that the new Edison alone had been heard. Wow, perception is learned. Except for one thing. This woman on the right side, Anna Case, she was one of the sopranos who participated in the tone tests. She revealed before her death in 1972 that she trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording of herself. <laughs> so now let's talk a little bit about physics. Here's a hypothetical image sensor, and the resolution of this is 2. Not 2K, but 2. We have 2 pixels across and 2 pixels down also, so it's both 2 lines and 2. Um, let's say we double the frame rate of whatever the frame rate is on this. Well, now we have half the exposure time. Half the exposure time means we need twice as much light. And maybe we have some other issues. Now, is it possible to fix that with processing? Yes. Someday, somebody could come up with a computer that could average the light over multiple frames, increase the brightness by doing that without affecting the temporal resolution. Um, but nobody's doing that at the moment. How about moving to higher spatial resolution? So again, here's our uh, image sensor, and it's got a resolution of 2, and now we want to make it a resolution of 4. Well, one way of doing that is we simply make it a bigger image sensor. It's twice as big. So now we have an image sensor that has a resolution of 4. But typically, a color television camera uses a prism for splitting the light and has three sensors, one for red, one for green, one for blue. It's difficult to do that with the larger sensor. It's not impossible. So this picture that I'm showing is taken from an article that appeared in the Simpty Journal in 2001 of the Lockheed Martin 4K camera. And this was a prism-based camera with huge sensors. Each sensor uh, had an image about that size on it, bigger than IMAX. Um, and it did have a prism, and it had a telecentric lens, magnificent camera but not so easy to handhold as you can see from the picture. So what the people who make the cameras with the larger sensors have done is something different. They take a single sensor instead of having a prism and they do on-chip color filtering. You may have heard of the Bayer filter, which is one of the patterns named for a researcher at Kodak whose last name was Bayer. Uh, here is one of those cameras. There are many, many cameras. I just chose this one because it happened to have this little thing in its brochure. And by the way, the dirt that you're seeing by the sensor, that's my fault from my scanner. It's not from their brochure. 
but you can very clearly read it says that they have an optical low-pass filter. That's a very good thing to have in a camera. It gets rid of aliases that you don't want to have. But my question is, how do they do that? Because if you have a single sensor, you have different resolutions for red, green, and blue. And if you have what's called a 4K sensor, then the green, mm, you could maybe consider it 4K. It's uh, what we engineers would call quincunx, or a checkerboard pattern. But the red and the blue clearly have only 2K resolution. They have half as many sensor positions as the green has. So if you do optical filtering that's correct for the green, it's wrong for the red and blue. And if you do optical filtering that's correct for the red and blue, it's wrong for the green. So how do you do optical filtering for a single sensor camera? You can do something, but it's not gonna be right. And so at the uh, SMPTE, uh, it was called Digital Cinema Summit at that time in 2008 at NAB, um, Peter Senton of Thompson Grass Valley then said, if the DALSA and RED1 are 4K cameras, then the Panavision Genesis and Sony F23 are 6K cameras because they had a pattern, a stripe pattern of the kind that's shown there. Now, if you have a single sensor imager, you get, at least internal to the camera, these kinds of color filter artifacts. I assure you that this is not a fence that was painted by an artist. Um, that's the way that the camera is portraying that fence. Now, obviously, that's no good, so we have to get rid of those artifacts, and we can do that. There's a process called debayering or demosaicing to get rid of the artifacts of the color filter, and it will get rid of that. But when you filter something, you make it have less. So we've gone to more, and now we go to less. Um, another problem with going to that large sensor is the lenses that I had previously, which are represented by the red circle, which certainly covers all of what the previous center, sensor uh, had, no longer work on the large sensor. We get vignetting around the edges. So that's why the 4K cameras, or cameras that are called 4K, uh, use primarily prime lenses and maybe some small zooms. Um, there's nothing of what I would call a long-range zoom yet, although I will say that last week on, I guess it was Friday the 16th, uh, Canon announced a 20 to 1 uh, PL mount 4K zoom lens. That's the longest range zoom lens that exists for a um, PL mount camera at the moment. So instead, people say, okay, we'll just use adapters from two-thirds inch lenses. Now, why do you even want a two-thirds inch lens? Because if you're shooting sports or a concert or an opera, the kinds of stuff that I do, then you need long lenses, lenses with 100 to 1 zoom ranges or something like that. Uh, so we'll use an adapter. But if you get an adapter, even if the adapter is optically perfect, it's losing 2.6 stops of light. 2.6 stops is roughly equivalent to about 600%. So you need 600% more light. So here's a common field camera lens uh, system that would be used in sports or concerts or whatever. Again, this is a 101 to 1 zoom ratio lens. And then there's the camera with its um, prism optics and very, very, very well-defined lens mount, including exactly how many microns the um, green and blue appear behind the uh, prism. So one alternative to that larger sensor is go to a smaller sensor and just divide it up more narrowly. So now each photo site is a quarter of the area of the previous photo sites. Well, that means it's gathering a quarter of the photons. So you can call it a quarter of the sensitivity or you can call it a quarter of the contrast, however you want to do it. Um, can we take care of that with processing? Yes, again, we could do an overall look get the brightness from the overall look, just derive the detail from the smaller stuff, but to the best of my knowledge, no one is doing that yet. And also fabricating these sensors is kind of difficult. So then we have alternative number two, which was shown uh, by Hitachi at the International Broadcasting Convention last month in the SKUHD 4000. It uses HD sensors, but it has four chips instead of three. There's two green chips, 
and the greens are offset by one half pixel diagonally, and so you can derive 4K resolution from that. It's a concept that we actually discussed at the HPA Tech Retreat uh, more than 10 years ago when Olympus was doing something like this. Um, but it's so exciting to the people who do sports and concerts and things that Gearhouse Broadcast placed an order for 50 of these right at the show. But there's still an issue remaining. Let's say you take one of those HD lenses that now works perfectly with your 4K camera, it's still an HD lens. So if this is the modulation transfer function of the lens or how much contrast the lens gives you at different resolutions, resolution or detail is increasing to the right and contrast is increasing heading up, then we see we've got pretty good contrast at HD, but in this hypothetical lens, we've got pretty poor contrast at 4K. And that's why Canon introduced just a 20 to 1 lens rather than a 100 to 1 lens. Canon has a 100 to 1 lens, but not for a 4K camera, at least not yet. So then we have alternative number three, and this is a very strange one. This was shown by Grass Valley first at the NAB convention this year in April. It's simply an HD camera, and it has 4K upconversion. So, you know, initial feeling about this, well, that's cheating, that's stupid. Um, but wait a second. It's got proper optical filtering, it's got proper electronic filtering, and the lens matches the sensor perfectly in terms of MTF. So maybe that's a great way to do upconversion. Maybe that's better processing than you can do out of these other uh, cameras. So something to think about. Now let's talk about physiology or our limits to visual acuity. So here's the view of 4K from 40,000 feet looks exactly the same as standard definition. You can't even see that there's a TV set down there 40,000 feet below. So humor me that distance means something. Now, what is the distance where it means something? What is the screen size? That's something else to be considered. Another physiological thing, visible colors. This is the familiar um, CIE chromaticity diagram. And you'll notice it has kind of a rounded shape. And if we take Three primaries, these are hypothetical primaries. Nobody has these primaries. No standard even calls for these primaries. But let's say these were three hypothetical primaries that we could get. This is the most area I can get out of this diagram. You can see that we're still losing a lot of colors to the left of the triangle and a lot of colors to the right of the triangle. So we're definitely not reproducing with three primaries as many colors as can be seen. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So here's a demonstration that took place at an HPA tech retreat a few years ago from Genoa Color Technologies. And what they do is they've come up with displays that have more than three primaries, say four or five primaries, so that they can increase the gamut of what you can see. And in the diagram on, uh, sorry, in the uh, picture on the left, um, on the right side of that, you can see the camera is shooting some kind of a stocking or something that's kind of uh, pinkish. And if you look at the uh, two images uh, at the top, you can see that the ordinary display on the left clearly is not reproducing the correct color, and the Genoa Color Technologies display on the right is reproducing the, the correct color. Does everyone in the audience see that? Yes. Okay, good. But what you're looking at right now is coming off a three primary projector. So, caveat emptor. Also notice that when you go to more primaries, at least in a uh, self-illuminating display like a TV set, you reduce the resolution, as I'm showing in the lower right. Okay, now let's talk about psychology. And this is where the creatives come in. And in this case, less can be more. What does a telephone call sound like today? Basically like anything else. We get full fidelity over telephone calls. What does a telephone call sound like in movies and television? Uh, it sounds something like this. Because otherwise it's not a telephone call. Otherwise it's somebody that you just can't see off screen who's talking. So creatives make telephone calls sound not like telephone calls sound so that you know they're telephone calls. Or take binoculars. There's the familiar view through binoculars, the figure eight. Except when you use binoculars, you never see a figure eight. If you see a figure eight, you haven't adjusted the binoculars right. <laughs> or how about 24P television? 
which a lot of creatives do, which is taking away from the look of higher frame rate television to give you something that looks the way that the creative wants it to look. It's up to the creatives. Engineers should not dictate to creatives what they can do. We should provide them with as many tools. We should provide them with tools. We should help them use those tools, but we should not tell them what to do. So here's what some creatives have done through the years. Let's talk about aspect ratio. Um, we always want a wider aspect ratio. Well, not necessarily. Here's a director some of you may have heard of, Sergei Eisenstein. Uh, he did a paper in 1930 called The Dynamic Square, in which he said, it is my desire to intone the hymn of the male, the strong, the virile, active, vertical composition. Or how about these directors that you may have heard of, Jean Renoir, Francois Truffaut. Um, since cinema is black and white, why photograph other colors? I think color has done as much damage to cinema as television. <laughs> or how about this guy? Um, you may not recognize his picture, you may not even be familiar with his name, but he won the Best Director Award Academy Award in 2011, and he says, I've met a lot of directors, and most of them have a fantasy to make a silent movie, because for directors, it's the purest way to tell a story. This is the movie that he made. It was called The Artist, uh, black and white, silent, best picture of 2011 at the Academy Awards. He was best director of 2011, and the movie, which cost about 15 million to make, has grossed 133 million box office to date. Which creatives? How about high frame rate? Here's a creative who tried high frame rate. He's a pretty uh, significant creative. He's somebody who directed Natalie Wood's last movie, and he tried a 60 frame per second movie, and he said, I concluded 60 frames per second is too vivid and lifelike for a traditional fiction film. It becomes invasive. For conventional movies, it's best to say with 24 frames per second. That's what was printed in American Cinematographer in an interview with him in 1994. And here is a picture of him at the Technology Summit on Cinema in 2011, where he was promoting higher frame rates. Uh, in all fairness, I think he was doing exactly the right thing. He's saying that high frame rate is a tool, and sometimes you want to use it, and sometimes you don't want to use it. And if you shoot in high frame rate, then you can make that decision later. And he's not only a director, he's also an engineer, and he's come up with some of the technology to allow you to make that change later. Um, here's another high frame rate movie, The Hobbit, that came out. And there were some complaints when The Hobbit came out. Some people said, oh, it makes me nauseous. Some people said, oh, it's too video-like. It doesn't tell the story. Um, that movie has grossed to date more than $1 billion at the box office. So it wasn't so shabby. Now, how about psychophysics? Psychophysics is not like psychobabble, that things that end in ness, like sharpness, um, brightness, loudness, are psychophysical functions. They are psychological responses to physical stimuli and they are not necessarily what you would measure of the physical stimulus. So you can think that something has higher loudness when in fact it's at a lower volume than something else. You can think that something has higher sharpness when in fact it has less spatial detail than something else. You can think, think that something has higher brightness when in fact it, is, um, it has less luminance than something else. Here is an image, and I didn't know how far the screen was going to be from you and what size the screen was going to be, but this image is called Angry Man, Neutral Woman, and I've shown it here four times. The only difference in the four is it keeps getting smaller. It's a fairly low-resolution image, so you're not really losing anything when it gets smaller. Now, I imagine almost everyone in this theater sees in the big image an angry man on the left and a neutral woman on the right. Is that correct? OK. Um, do you see anything different in some of the smaller images? Does anyone see the angrier person being on the right? OK. You could also see the same thing by walking around the theater. If you come up to the screen, then you'll see the 
person on the left turning angry even in the smaller image and the person on the right uh, turning less angry. This is a compound image, obviously. Uh, there's two sets of images. One of them has the angry person on the left. The other one has the angry person on the right. The only difference is the spatial resolution of the images. So one has less than two cycles per degree. The other one is more than four cycles per degree. So here is what's called a contrast sensitivity function. Uh, does everyone see sort of a curve at the bottom of this? Okay, it's not there. Your visual system is putting in the curve. And where the peak of the curve is, or the trough of the curve is, is going to depend on your visual system. Again, if you walk up and down, you'll see that uh, location of the curve changing. So, um, the curve varies with the uh, retinal angle and the observer. Um, this is a modulation transfer function, or how much contrast we can send through a system. The system could be the lens, the system could be a sensor and its digital filtering, system could be an entire television station or movie studio or whatever. The curve shape is going to vary by many factors, filtering, uh, lens dif diffraction, imager resolution, and so on. But the sharpness that we perceive is proportional either to, if you follow the people I follow, the square of the area under the curve, or if you follow the Ari and Zeiss people, it's the area under the curve. Either way, the area is what's important, not the resolution heading to the right. And so Sony took advantage of this when they introduced HD cam. They got rid of a significant amount of the resolution. It only goes up to 1440 instead of 1920 in horizontal resolution. They lost a lot of resolution, but they lost much less sharpness because all they lost was the area under the toe of the curve. The rest was the same. So Panasonic did the same thing in DVC Pro HD. Other people have uh, done similar things. Now, here's an interesting thing. When we superimpose the two curves, um, everything below the white dotted line is invisible. Everything above the yellow line is not reproduced. So the only stuff you really have to work with is what's in that little wedge on the left. And so it makes a lot more difference if you can increase the shoulder of that curve somehow than if you can extend it to the right. Nevertheless, there are some significant reasons for going to higher resolution or higher sampling. This is called a sync function or a sine x over x function. It's basic digital filters, maybe the most basic digital filter that's possible. The numbers at the bottom are simply arbitrary um, numbers of samples, but that's the shape of the curve for filtering a digital image. Well, if the end of that curve, number 11, is 1080 lines, then the contrast ratio at 1080 lines is zero. But if the end of that curve is 2160 lines, like going to 4K, then the contrast at 1080 lines is 64%. And as you can see from the little contrast wedge on the left, 64% is a lot more contrast than zero. So there is an advantage to using a higher resolution sensor. Here is some real world examples. These are some old Canon digital SLRs, the EOS 10D and the EOS 20D. Uh, the 20D has a little bit more resolution than the 10D does. And so the MTF curve is going a little bit more to the right, but notice that it's increasing the shoulder of the curve as well as stuff going farther down in the curve. So what does that look like in the real world? Here's portions of images and I think even under these conditions, wherever you're sitting in the theater, it probably looks to you like the thing on the right is sharper than the thing on the left. Even if you can't read anything, you don't really have enough resolution, you still have that sensation that there's more sharpness. And that's with just a 14% change in resolution. So here's a slide that was shown at um, the Society for Information Displays Display Week this year and it's from somebody at Sony, and he's come up with this pentagon uh, with these tick marks on it 
the five visual improvements possible, um, increasing spatial resolution, increasing temporal resolution, increasing contrast, increasing color gamut, and increasing quantization. And he could have also added things about sound, increasing the quality of the sound, and increasing the uh, surround field of the sound. But my problem with it is not the five things, but it's those tick marks. Like, if we go another tick mark, we get another increase in quality, just like we did when we went the last tick mark. And it doesn't seem to really work that way. Um, so let's start with quantization. Now, this one, to me, is kind of a throwaway. Um, the reason is, if you do proper engineering, you don't get the contour lines. All you get is noise. But because nobody does proper engineering, you get the contour lines. So more bits means you get fewer contour lines. And if you get enough bits, the contour lines go away. This is terrible. You know, you're watching a movie and suddenly there's lines through the sky. Well, the sky doesn't have lines in it. I'm sorry. A um, little bit about color. Now, these are, pictures are courtesy of Sigma Designs. This is showing completely wrong color decoding. So on the left, I have a picture that was encoded as REC 601 and decoded as REC 709. Uh, on the right, I'm showing a picture that was encoded as REC 709 and decoded as REC 601. And then the middle is what it's supposed to look like. And they're different, no question. But they're not that different. So um, one more thing on color, which is color adaptation. And this picture, um, the person who created the picture has done the worst possible thing that could be done, eliminating the red channel completely. So you have nothing here but green and blue. But what color is the top that the woman is wearing? Anyone? Sorry? Yellow, right. That's the color. And sure enough, if we restore the red channel, no question, she's wearing a yellow top. But now let's say I remove the red only from her top. That's what you just saw. I'll go back so you can see it again. Um, but anyway, the first picture you saw, that's what color the top was. But our eyes adapt to wide area color. We can have tremendous problems in color and still be able to see things properly. Um, so my gut feeling, and I'm willing to be proven wrong, is that going to a wider color gamut, it's not that big a wow. How about sound, immersive sound? Uh, there's a German company called uh, Penguin Engineering Bureau, and um, they did tests at IBC in 2013, and they revealed the tests at IBC in uh, 2014, and lo and behold, more channels made people feel the sound was more immersive. Hooray! But there is something significant here. Um, the more immersive the sound was to begin with, the less people were excited by the even more immersive sound. So yeah, big deal going from mono to stereo, um, big deal going from stereo to 5.1 surround, going from 5.1 to 9.1, going from 5.1 to 22.2, which is what NHK is pushing. Um, more questionable. Now, there are things you can do with ob object-based sound, and you're going to hear some of that later, and that's uh, pretty significant. And, um, oops, let me just, no, I can't back up. But uh, one of the things that I want to say about sound, I participated in some tests in the 1970s um, that showed just stereo sound at, in the days when TV was just mono, and one of the comments we got from focus groups pretty typically was the stereo sound made the picture larger. So sound is a very significant thing. So now let's talk about higher spatial resolution. Why are we even talking about 4K and beyond? This is a chart from ARRI, and they introduced it long before they had a 4K camera. They had a 6K scanner that they introduced with this at about the right time. And here's a movie theater, and they're showing for people with 2020 vision how much detail they can see. And you can see that all the way in the back of the theater, you can see 3K. Well, that's more than what this projector is giving you. Um, in the middle of the theater, you can see 4K, and towards the front of the theater, you can see 8K. But does it make that much difference? These are the uh, movies of 2013, the top 10 movies, 
and uh, not one of them, uh, sorry, number 10, uh, was shot um, with a 4K camera, or camera that calls it 4K, uh, sorry, number 8 and number 10. Uh, were shot with the Red Epic. But the cameras above that, some of them were shot with film, which, as we all know, is dead. And uh, some of them were shot with a less than 3K camera, which is the Ari Alexa, which is an excellent camera. Um, here's an image courtesy of Pete Luday of Spider-Man. And his point is that um, there's no 4K information in the computer graphics because virtually all computer graphics, even for what's called a 4K movie, are being done in 2K. Here is an image that uh, Pete Putman did. Uh, this was a 4K display that was shot at NAB two th in 2014, and people kept asking, is that 4K? Um, I had the opposite thing. I was in a TV truck last week with a director and... I had an OLED monitor, an HD OLED monitor, and he said to me, that's a 4K monitor, right? But it was an HD monitor. So it was the sharpness that was, he was getting from the contrast that was significant. Uh, by the way, whatever the viewing distance is at home, and that varies depending on whether the viewer is relaxed or excited, that's a yardstick uh, next to the viewer, when you shop for TVs, you're always closer. And when you go to trade shows like Simti, you're always closer. That was noted by Sarah Pearson, who was at the HPA Tech Retreat. Um, so here was an 8K demonstration at NAB this year by NHK. And they had the footprints of where you're supposed to stand next to that set. If there was a couch there, your knees would have hit the cabinet. So. Now let me show you some results of viewer tests. And again, it is 2014. I emphasize that. Again, I emphasize the conditions matter, the source material matters. But this was first shown at the HPA Tech Retreat um, in 2013 by Hans Hoffman of the European Broadcasting Union. And what they found was no question from any form of HD, which is the first three lines to 4K, there is a significant improvement. No question. Uh, the black line is the improvement you would get if you were watching the TV from a distance of one and a half times the viewing height, which for a 56 inch TV is about 40 inches. So if you're a little over a yard from your TV, that's how much improvement you get. If you're sitting at nine feet from your TV, a typical viewing distance, then you get the red line improvement which is considerably less, maybe a third of a grade. But even if you're only 40 inches from that TV, you're getting a half of a grade of improvement. Now, here's some stuff that CNET wrote about, and they said, well, you know, there's things that are more worthwhile than 4K, and maybe 4K is even causing picture quality trade-offs. Um, we are at a SIMTI event. SIMTI stands for the Society of Motion picture and television engineers. So why are we talking about spatial static resolution, which is what 4K is? So here are two motion pictures. Um, they have identical static resolution. You can see that the ties and the tracks underneath the locomotive have identical resolution in both pictures. But the bottom picture is clearly sharper than the top picture because the bottom picture was shot at a higher temporal resolution, a higher frame rate. This is 300 versus 50. Um, this is courtesy of Pete Luday again. He's showing, you know, if, if this were a 4K image, um, there's no 4K information. There's not even 2K information. There's not even HD information. But here's something you can do for homework. This is from an artwork called Street that was created by an artist called James Nairs. You can look this up on the internet and you can watch a couple of minutes of it. It's uh, an hour long artwork, I think. And notice how everything looks much sharper in this. Now, some of the stuff is out of focus because he didn't focus the lens properly. He was driving along. But this, everyone in this picture is moving. They're not actors being static. They are real world people who are moving around and yet it looks much sharper than what you saw because of the higher frame rate. So now let's look at higher frame rate. If we go from HD to 4K, that's increasing the data rate, the raw data rate, either pre-compression or post-compression, by a factor of eight. 
Leon told you it's four times the number of pixels, which is correct, but you're also either going from interlaced to progressive or you're going from 720, which is only one megapixel, uh, up to 4K. So for an increase of eight times the data rate, you get maybe a half grade improvement. So that would be 16 times the data rate per grade of improvement. Now in this chart, which was shown by the EBU at the International Broadcasting Convention uh, in 2013, you get a full grade of improvement for each doubling of the frame rate. And that's only a two to one data rate increase. But is that the most bang for the buck? No, there's actually more. So here's Variety talking about Dolby's HDR system, and they're saying it delivers a bigger wow than ultra high definition, speaking of the spatial resolution. Um, what is higher di high dynamic range? Well, here's an image. This was shot by Joe Kane, um, and it's kind of dark, but you can see the trees outside. Here's another image. We're now overexposing the trees outside. You can still tell there are trees out there, but you can't see much of them, but you have some sense of what's happening. And now we'll overexpose the image some more, and now we can see that there's Halloween kind of stuff at this um, chairlift or this uh, ski lift area, but now you can't even tell that there's trees outside. For all you know, this is an indoor picture. So high dynamic range would offer all of that in one shot, and it is possible to get that from cameras today with today's technology. This is an image that was shown of uh, a lab. There's a uh, chip chart, pink chip chart, so you can see contrast. All of the light in this image is coming from the 500 watt lamp that is aimed directly into the lens of the camera. So here is an image of the filament from that lamp. You can count the spirals in the filament. You can see that fine. And yet you can see every chip on the chip chart as well. There is a 10 million to one contrast ratio here or more than 23 stops. This was shown at NAB at the uh, Simpty Digital Cinema Summit in 2008. The technology existed. This is a Grass Valley Sensium sensor. Did Grass Valley sell any cameras that you could do this with? No. Technology existed, the sensor was in the cameras, but no cameras were yet available that had it. So now let's talk about what dynamic range does to sharpness increase. So let's say we go way beyond by going from HD to 4K, we're extending the toe of that curve and we're not getting very much area. The area is staying pretty much the same. But if we could simply increase the lens MTF, and get more contrast at higher resolution, now we're getting more area, we're getting more sharpness. And if we could make the entire picture sharper by increasing the brightness, now we've got a huge amount more area. We've got huge amounts of sharpness. So as far as I can tell from what I've seen, high dynamic range is absolutely the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and sure enough, here's some preliminary results that were shown at the Technology Summit for Cinema at NAB this year. Uh, this is from the Swiss uh, Polytechnic Institute of uh, Lausanne. And um, you can see the, the slope on this curve is tremendous. Today's TVs already have considerably more brightness than the reference monitors that we are using. So we can get a lot of bang for the buck out of this and very little increase in frame rate, any, and, no, sorry, data rate, anything from zero if you believe uh, you don't need extra bits to you know 20% or something if you think you do need extra bits. Now let me put those three curves together. So that's what happens if you go from HD to 4K, you get between a third and a half of a grade of improvement. That's what happens if you go to higher frame rate, you get a full grade of improvement for every doubling. And at the end, that's what happens if you go to higher dynamic range, uh, anything from zero to 20%, and you get a full grade of improvement. So unquestionably, uh, that's the biggest bang for the buck in terms of data rate. But there's a problem. All these things interact. So, um, if we go to higher spatial resolution, there's more pixels across the frame, so there's more pixels that need to be traversed by something that's moving in the image or when you're panning the camera. 
So if I had something that was 720p at 120 frames per second, then in less than 11 seconds, I can go from one end of the screen to the other end of the screen and not have any aliases without filtering or anything like that. If I go to 4K at 24 frames per second, then it's almost uh, three minutes to have something cross the screen and not have any aliasing without the filtering. Now, at the right is a chart from a paper on um, sampled presentation. This was done by the people at the Visual Space Perception Laboratory at Berkeley. And I've added the red oval. The black circle is what's visible. The stuff outside the black circle is not visible. Uh, what you want is what's inside the red oval. You want that nice black line in the center. But you don't want the other lines. The other lines are motion aliases that are being introduced by insufficient frame rate. But notice that those lines are not all black. Some of them are gray. Some of them almost fade to white. When they fade out to white, you don't see any alias. That's a function of the uh, sampling filtering. So if you increase the dynamic range, you're now making the motion aliases more visible. So even though high dynamic range probably gives you the most pow for the buck in terms of data rate, you might also need to go to a higher frame rate so that you don't have the motion aliases. But there are ways around that. There are the classic waiter shot. Every time you see a movie, whoops, uh, you see a waiter being followed by the camera who has nothing to do with the plot. You'll see something later today, I think, where the waiter does have something to do with the plot. Um, but it's a way of having you not see the aliases that are happening in the background. When you see the thing today as they pan with the waiter moving across the scene, watch the background and you'll see things just flashing on and off like crazy. Uh, unbelievable strobing. But obviously this does not work for live sports. It does not work for the operas that I do, ballets, stuff like that. Here is something from the Consumer Electronics Association. Um, and this is why everyone's talking about 4K. It's because they want to sell TV sets that have 4K. They've already gotten to that point. They're theoretically working on frame rate. They're theoretically working on dynamic range, bit depth, colorimetry. But the place that they're already there is those 4K TV sets. Um, so kind of summing up, the POW factor, absolutely high dynamic range seems to offer the most POW, certainly for the uh, bit rate buck. Uh, high frame rate, again, pretty high POW, and you can see it from any distance on essentially any size display. 4K, much less, but again, perception is learned, so maybe we need to learn about that. Um, freedom from lens issues, high frame rate, no effect on lenses at all. Use any lens you want. Increase the frame rate, makes no difference. High dynamic range, little bit of a lens issue. You have to make sure the lens has enough contrast capability. 4K, huge lens issues. And that's why this Canon achievement of even a 20 to 1 lens is very significant. Uh, freedom from motion artifacts, obviously high frame rate frees you from motion artifacts. But the surprise one is that high dynamic range and 4K both increase the motion artifacts. And the likeliness not to affect current storytelling practices uh, and sensations, well, 4K, because it's not really doing much for you, so it's not going to affect anything. <laughs> uh, high dynamic range, maybe it bothers you. Matt Cowan has shown some interesting things that maybe we don't want to go to high dynamic range. High frame rate, again, The Hobbit, there are some indications that there could be issues. But at the same time, let me point out those creatives that I showed you before. People in the old days said, hey, Black and white, you go from black and white to color, it's a mess. You go from silent to sound, it's a mess. And maybe it is, but maybe that's a tool that's useful to you anyway. So maybe those other tools, HDR and HFR, are things that are significant and that you want to go to. Um, so at that point, I'm pretty much done. You can see 4K is not the end. The Consumer Electronics Association already talking about 5K.